So as Matt briefly introduces, we're a data governance software company and we have this niche audience in a way of chief data officers and data stewards and data arenas and, and the like. So we had to sort of adapt our message a little bit to the variety of audience, which is on the one hand uh, technical as well as business, if I understood it correctly, right? So I'll try to give you as, uh, as good as a story as I can or a multitude of stories. And if there's questions at the end, I believe you have like five minutes of questions. So first, let me um, talk to you about the frustration that I've seen with uh, uh, you know, uh, companies and when it comes to getting a value of data. So if you, you know, if just like this guy here, I forget your name, I'm sorry, but you know, you're trying to find machine learning experts, oh sorry, and uh, you know, data scientists and all that stuff, and you find that there's not a lot of good ones out there, uh, but then you, let's say you find one or you find a team, then you're gonna actually hit their frustrations, which uh, are many, but there are two very important ones. One of their first frustrations is, I can't find the data. Right, that's like their biggest problem. Where's the data? Give me the data. I'll put the models on it. Then when they have the data, then the next problem appears, and then it's all, you know, they they make all sorts of classifiers, beautiful visualizations, training data, sample data, what have you, and then they produce beautiful output, whatever they produce, models, classifiers, but then the organization sort of does nothing with it. Right, they don't make a product out of it. They don't make a service out of it. They don't change their business process. So these uh, talented people that you then hire are becoming demotivated and will actually go somewhere else just because their work is not actually adding any value to the business. So I'll try to talk about some of these topics. And I'm going to put that in the context of these uh, seven predictions we did with Calibra about uh, nine months ago, I would say. Um, and uh, I'll see if I can remember them and, and I'll tell you which ones were actually uh, completely wrong. So the first one is about uh, the rise and fall of the CDO, the Chief Data Officer. And I'm going to again uh, play on you know, the email story. So you know, we think from our viewpoint as a data governance software vendor that the Chief Data Officers are on, are on the rise, which they are. But the question is how temporary are they actually going to be? Uh, and then I learned from one of our customers who did a startup like 20, 30 years ago when email wasn't around that back then they actually had messaging systems that they bought and sold, and they had a chief email officer back then. Nobody has a chief email officer right now, right? So the CDO, how long will it last? It will still grow, but how long will it last? Um, second, data will require a system of record, right? Just like the chief financial officer has a CRM, um, an ERP, or the VP of sales has a CRM system, data will have the same kind of need. Three, data education will explode, and it has, right? I think there's another uh, Belgian startup called DataCamp who has a million uh, um, students all teaching data science, so there's a lot of data learning out there. Uh, ideally, this translates all the way through, not into the technicalities of how to make a Python script, but actually into how does data get into an MBA program, for example, right? Um, four on the predictions was... Um, what was it again? Uh, the data, data citizens, who are all people who use data to do their work. In our company, product managers are data citizens, for example. Sales ops is data citizens. They will rise up against the data dictator. That's a chief data officer who tries too much to control the data and doesn't democratize it enough for people to actually get value out of it. So that will also happen. Um, uh, what are we now? Five, the Internet of Things will disrupt business models, of course. That's already happened. We were too late with that one. Uh, data protection will uh, overcome data privacy, especially with the European uh, GDPR uh, protection rule. And then the last one I think we had uh, was all about that the blockchain will emerge in 2017. So the last one, at least from our vantage point, we got completely wrong because when we were saying uh, the, the, the whole blockchain thing to our, at our user event a couple of months back, half of the audience, you're not doing this right now, right? but half of the audience was actually Googling what blockchain actually meant. So for us, we got that one completely wrong. Um, and what I wanted to, uh, I, I, I use this story as a context for what we actually uh, missed, because the one that we missed, as I understand it, is a very popular topic in this audience, and it's very simple, right? The one we missed, uh, 
I would say, because of my silly reasons, is uh, artificial in intelligence and machine learning. So I'll tell you why we didn't put that on the map. Uh, because I'm a little bit of a skeptic. Uh, and, you know, we had the AI winter in the 70s and the 80s when the government funding dried up. And then the first commercial applications failed. And then again, back another story from Belgium, my home country. I've been living in New York now for three years. We had that whole natural language processing event that happened where you had Flanders Language Valley and that boomed and busted. Right? So there's a lot of cycles that already went through AI. And from that viewpoint, I didn't believe that it would hype as much as it would uh, this year. So that one we got wrong. Now, why do I believe that it did hype this year or is exploding this year? Multiple reasons. One, the processor power. Uh, if, you, um, if you've seen it, for example, NVIDIA has increased its uh, stock price uh, by four times over the last 12 months because everything is GPU driven right now, matrix operations. Uh, two, more data. Everybody knows that, right? Uh, there's more data out there to actually apply your algorithms on. And three, and this is a belief of me that could be wrong, is that actually the big tech firms, AI, um, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and all the others, they're using AI and machine learning as their next feature war, like who will have the best platform to build on. So that's why uh, we believe we should have put this on. But because we're a little bit of a skeptic, we would also like to you know, give you three pitfalls to watch out for in this session when it comes to AI. And the first one is Harry Potter here. It's not a magic wand. Maybe this is the most wrong picture we could have taken, right? Because Harry Potter's not AI at all. Um, but this is about um, how we as engineers tend to look at technology as the thing that will solve all the world's problems. And then I got another story from that. When we started uh, 10 years ago, our professor said, you know, uh, back in the day, there was a spin-off at the university, and they were all gung-ho about object-oriented uh, uh, programming. So that was going to be their company, object-oriented programming. That was their differentiator. So it's an engineer or a computer scientist looking at technology as a differentiator. But how does that actually add value to the business? The funniest thing about this story is the name of that company. You know what they called it? Softcore. <laughs> Come on, right? <laughs> so um, with respect to uh, the magic wand aspect of AI at the moment, I would say don't, uh, you know, don't expect that Johnny Depp is going to show up and turn into some super intelligence controlling nanobots all over the place. You're going to find most business applications of AI currently in very specialized applications right, for a very specialized business problem. Even self-driving um, self cars are very specialized, right? Uh, you can't have that same algorithm or machinery that you produced drive a bicycle, right? It's going to have to learn all over again. Uh, the way you recognize faces is different from the way you recognize other things, for example. So AI will uh, have business value first in specialized applications. Just So look for it in your business in that uh, very clear requirement how does it add um, value? How does it reduce cost? How does it reduce or mitigate risk? That's where you have to look. And if you don't believe me, just think about the cost of doing AI. Right? Even, uh, I believe, Google, when they came out with uh, AutoML, I think it's called, they did this experiment where they had one uh, neural network learn what the features or the, the configuration should be for a child or a slave neural network. And that one experiment took 800 GPUs, uh, about several weeks of calculation time, just to run one experiment. Right? So you don't want to invest that cost if you don't know what the value is going to be. Your electricity bill is going to go through the roof. Right? So that's one thing to watch out for. The second thing to watch out for with AI is uh, the salesman's uh, pitch. Uh, so it's, it's all about during, doing your due diligence. And I'm going to use two examples here that have had a lot of attention in the media. And I, I don't want to diss IBM. It's a good company. Right? But I am going to use them as an example. You know how they did this big thing with Watson winning Jeopardy and so on and so forth? So around the same time, they also did this big announcement that they were going to solve cancer together with the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Now, several years later, and $60 million down the drain, 
that initiative failed. It actually failed. They stopped doing it and they went back to market. Why did it fail? Because um, they were having challenges in connecting Watson to the electronic health record system. Pretty fundamental, right? If you want to get some data going in there. And second, they had too little good data. Turns out that all these papers that are out there in the field about oncology and whatnot, that there's actually just a very small subset um, that actually has uh, very curated and controlled clinical trials that have the right amount or the right data that actually feeds into the algorithms. Uh, and then there's another uh, story that was uh, a sort of a failure of machine learning that maybe you all know. It's the Google um, uh, Trends, the flu prediction, if you know that story, a few years old. So they predicted, based on search keywords in Google, um, that the flu was going to do an outbreak. And uh, they said they would do this better than the CDC, or faster, instantaneous. So they did that, and then it worked, until it didn't. So in 2013, they had a mismatch of 140% uh, prediction versus the actual situation in the world. And again, why was that? Because of all sorts of basic checks, right? They, they had their model being overfit, right? They, had, uh, they didn't take into account that the data actually changed. They changed Google, the search suggestions in the meantime. So that changed the data that was produced that was then consumed by the algorithm. So again, basic things. So don't fall into the snake oil salesman's trap and please do your due diligence on the technology. And then the last one um, is the algorithms. So our belief is that um, AI and machine learning, you will not win this war by having the better algorithm. The differentiator, the value proposition, is not in the algorithm. It's actually in the data. The algorithms will be open source. I don't know if you've seen data scientists or machine learning people in, in action, but they're typically sitting in Jupyter or Zeppelin typing in Python commands in these notebooks and then immediately seeing a classifier or a visualization. So it's pretty cool, right? Um, but these algorithms themselves, the neural networks, they're, they're open source. Uh, Google actually acquired Kaggle, right, which is all about open sourcing the models on certain data science problems. So you're not going to differentiate yourself with the models. So you're going to differentiate yourself with the proprietary training data that you actually feed into the models. Why do you think Google has been buying data acquisition companies for years for a lot of money? Why do you think Google makes all these weird devices, like this backpack that scans the street or this car that scans the street? They're just, or Nest, right? Uh, the 1984 spy cam that you put in your, in your house, that sort of stuff. They do this so they can actually get proprietary data that is making all the difference. So our view is on AI is that data will differentiate how you will succeed with AI and machine learning. And then you come full circle to the beginning of my story, which was about that frustration. How can that uh, data scientist or business analyst or whatever you call that person, how can they actually get the data? So their, their questions typically go as follows. Uh, give me the data. I, by the way, that question just pisses me off. When a data scientist comes to me and says I don't have data, then I tell them go find it, right, or make it. It's not an excuse. It's not an excuse. Just go get it. It's part of your job, right? And if you need to write a Python script or hack into the database of your own internal company, just do it. Get the data. <laughs> There's no excuse. But anyway, so they can't find the data. When they then can find it, they cannot understand the data. They don't know the business context. They don't know how to interpret it, which could be pretty basic, right? Because bias is lying, is uh, like a snake in the data grass, if you will. Um, if they then can understand it, they don't know where it's coming from, the lineage, as people often say. If they understand where it's coming from, they don't know what's wrong with it. And if they don't know what's wrong with it, or they do know that everything is okay, they don't know who to actually call and ask about that data. They don't know the data owner. They don't know the data curator. Right? So all of these are problems about finding, understanding, and trusting data that are so commonplace, in our view, in AI projects. And not just in AI projects, because the way we see it is that this is all a people problem, right? 
This is all being done in multiple places, multiple data projects all over the map. And it's all people doing ad hoc, what we call um, the, w, the digital equivalent of WD40 and uh, duct tape, which is Excel, and spreadsheets, meetings, etc. One minute, all right. Um, uh, so they, people do this in AI, they do this in BI and analytics, all the same things, right? All the same steps. They do it in big data, Internet of Things projects, data quality projects, GDPR, regulatory compliance projects, and so many more. So it's like there's firefighting around data controls all over the place, all the time. It's just disorganized. It has all the symptoms of a broken down business process. And data today, if you treat it as a strategic asset, should have its own business process. So that's my um, last slide. I put some links up there for you to um, read uh, all about this. And we have our university at the bottom if you want to do some free uh, learning just as well. Thank you. Did I make the time? Yes, very nicely done. Thank you. Thanks, um, tell us, actually, Ed, uh, who's in the back, can you bring back the last slide? Yes, okay, people can take pictures. Uh, tell us a bit more about uh, Colibra, the company. So you started alluding to what you guys do at the end, but tell us about data governance, data cataloging, what are the needs, and what does the product do? Well, you know, thanks, Matt. I will I would be happy to do that, although I don't know if the audience will be. Because typically, if I tell what Calibra does, and I say that we're a data governance software company, then everybody's eyes just sort of glaze over. Oh, governance, that's not interesting. But our job as a company, Matt, is actually to try and make governance uh, sexy, or at least as sexy as you can uh, make it, by focusing on both parts of governance. So in our view, governance is about the control and enablement of any and all data management activities. Right? So enablement as much as control. And in that context, defining, understanding, trusting, the whole collaboration uh, of data, just knowing who to call about what data domain, all of these are aspects of governance. Um, and that's what we've been doing since I was talking to Bob earlier, or sorry, to Matt, uh, so, or Sean, sorry. Um, since 2008, so it's almost a decade, uh, we've been doing nothing but data governance and cataloging since 2008. Yeah. Is, there, what, is there a difference between data governance and data cataloging? Data cataloging, do you want to explain maybe for the um, audience? In our view, yes. So uh, we, what we've done, uh, we've been quite fortunate in the sense that we've been able to shape the data governance category, which is still in flux. Uh, and in our view, um, the data governance category does include cataloging. And my view on this, uh, Matt, is very simple. If you have a data catalog, which is really like a listing of all the data sets and attributes, dictionaries uh, that are out there, without governance around it, it's just like a phone book. It doesn't do anything, it's not controlled, it doesn't work, it's gonna stop working. Reason why I say that is because I've talked to all the high tech companies like Twitter, LinkedIn, etc., and they all have their catalog projects Many of them have actually open sourced uh, catalog initiatives, but then you find that nobody's actually using them. Right? There's no enforcement to use them, there's not enough enablement, and the first time you hit uh, the catalog, you get all these questions that I, uh, that I mentioned, right? Okay, but then who's the owner? Who do I call? Uh, what if I have a problem with the data? How do I get access to the data? Who approves my request? You get into governance questions right away. And last question from me, and then I'll open it up to people. Um, from a governance standpoint, is the right approach a, a data lake where you centralize everything and then you put governance on top? Or is it a more distributed approach where you have mo leave the data in, in the original repositories, but then you, I guess you need more agile uh, governance software? Uh, I would say that, the, um, that the, um, whether you put all your data in a lake uh, or you put it in a warehouse or you keep it separate in their applications or wherever you store it, is more a function uh, of the um, requirements and the data engineering that follows from it. For example, if you need a lot of scale and limitedly, then maybe a lake is the best solution. Uh, if you don't, maybe something else is the best solution. Um, so in that sense, uh, we're w less worried about the data architecture. We're more worried about how you're going to uh, coordinate all these people that make use or put in place the data architecture 
uh, that satisfy your needs. What we do see a lot right now is indeed the centralized uh, data lake approaches. Uh, but again, I'm being skeptical. I think that's just, just it's the new thing to try, right? So many companies are sinking so much money in one of the big three uh, distributions. And then, you know, there's two years down the line and people are actually asking, you know, what are we doing? So, again, just me. Great. Do we have uh, other questions? Yes, Microphone yeah. coming your way in just about 10 seconds. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on sort of the ownership of data with concerns about sort of individuals' right to data privacy. Um, and I think this is a bigger issue in the Europe than it is here where they have much more stringent requirements on uh, the ability for companies to use like individual level data. Right, so the question was about um, data ownership, if I understood correctly, and my views on it. Yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to break data ownership down in, in two views. One is that I'm hearing what I'm hearing you say, where ownership is really like in Europe with the individual, right? So it's it's my data; those are my emails, Google, and if I want to move them to Hotmail, you got to allow me to do that, which is a very European view, which Europe is actually through regulation trying to impose on any business doing business in Europe. So it also applies to tech companies. But then, you know, I was in uh, Silicon Valley talking to a Stanford guy a number of years ago and putting forth that European stance. No, you can't. No, the data is mine, right? It's, it's my data. And he was saying, yeah, Stan, you know, just forget about it. You've already lost. The, whether you think so or no, the data is already in the hands of these technology companies. So that's definitely going to continue. And I'm hoping that the regulations will impose enough sanctions so that these big, uh, you know, internet giants are actually uh, allowing more control of an individual's data because that's currently the complete lock-in and that's going to, that's at risk of monopolizing markets in a way. If you talk about ownership uh, in the company's view, like I'm a company and we have all these databases and who's the owner of that, that's a very interesting topic, right? So nobody wants to take responsibility. No, no, I don't want to be the data owner. So there what you have to do is you have to sort of sneak ownership under the door. You have to sort of say to the business executive or the, or the process or application owner, yeah, it's just your face next to this data domain. You know, it's, don't worry about it until, you know, you're like a year down the line and they actually start adopting it. So I'd be happy to, do, to go deeper, uh, but those are like two angles on ownership. Thank you. Stan, we're running a little bit long. Are you going to be around after the talks? Yeah. Uh, during, okay, so people can ask you questions directly. Thank you so much. This was Thank terrific. You.